The Quran talks about the believers being pulled out of darknesses, multiple shades of darkness into light on multiple occasions. And the one occasion that I want to talk to you a little bit about inshallah in this session is the one I recited to you. I chose to recite the passage in the beginning because I believe that reciting the Quran and listening to the recitation of the Quran, not only is that an act of worship, but it actually is a, uh, it has an effect on our Iman. Listening to the recitation of the Quran, the, to the one reciting and the one listening also, it affects and benefits their Iman. And if we're going to benefit from something from the understanding of these ayat, we should also benefit from the barakah of its recitation. Plus, of course, it fulfills a beautiful sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He reads onto the people, recites the ayat onto the people. In any case, Allah azza wa jal, if you noticed, I started reciting with the ayah that probably most of you have memorized, which ayah was that? Ayat al-Kursi. And this grand ayah of the Qur'an, Sayyidu Ayat al-Qur'an, Sayyidatu Ayat al-Qur'an, the, the grand leader, the chief ayah of the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal describes some of his most fundamental qualities and how incredibly, how awesome he is, how magnificent he is, that there's no one worthy of worship or obedience in any way, shape or form except he is. Now you have to understand, Surah Al-Baqarah is a Makki Surah, or Madani Surah rather. The Prophet has already moved to Medina. And the Muslims, some of them have been Muslim from the very beginning, and some of them relatively new, but all of them understand the basics of Islam. And the most basic teaching of Islam is La ilaha illallah, right? It's the most basic teaching of Islam. And this far into the message of Islam, Allah chooses to reveal an ayah that goes back to the basics. This far in. This is like, should be like early Makkah and Quran. You should be learning about La ilaha illallah. But Allah, La ilaha illallah, comes and these kinds of ayat come in Madani Quran. You know why? Because they're not just information, they're a reminder. Because somebody could say La ilaha illallah and be a Muslim, but they're not conscious of what that really means. And so, especially in the Madani Quran, when we hear ayat about Iman, when we hear ayat about Tawheed, they're actually a reminder to the Muslims that they need to refresh their Iman. They need to go back to those basics. That I need to hear La ilaha illallah as though I've never heard it before. I have to start over again. And this is one of the, you know, the beautiful things in our faith is this tajdeedul iman, the revival of iman. Because our faith is not just an intellectual thing. Everybody knows La ilaha illallah. Everybody here knows it. There's no one in this audience that doesn't know La ilaha illallah. But you know what? Our hearts and our minds are two different things. The heart needs to be reminded of La ilaha illallah so it's shaken by it. We don't feel La ilaha illallah sometimes. The ayat in Medina that remind us of Tawheed and remind us of Allah's attributes aren't just there to teach us, they're actually there to shake us up. Allah says, Alam ya'ni lilladhina amanu an takhsha'a qulubuhum li dhikrillah. Isn't it yet time that the believers, their hearts should be full of fear from the remembrance of Allah? وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ And because of whatever came down from the truth. Understand also that in, in, uh, uh, in Madani Qur'an, the word La ilaha illallah, obviously a negation of any form of shirk. That we shouldn't be associating partners with Allah. When the mushrikun of Makkah, the idol worshippers of Makkah thought about that, they thought this is negating their idols. This is negating the things that they worship, they have around the Kaaba. And Allah is saying none of those should be worshipped, only Allah should be worshipped. But when the same thing is being said to the Muslims in Medina, there are no idols. What idols are there? There's no shit going on. So when, and by the way, every time La ilaha illallah is mentioned, every time it's mentioned, it's supposed to destroy some form of shirk. It gets rid of shirk. That's part of the definition of the statement. So there is another kind of shirk in Medina. A hidden kind of shirk. There's an obvious kind of shirk in Makkah. It's those idols, you can see them right in front. Allah al manat al uzza Allah mentions them by name. But in, and on the other hand, you have another kind of shirk creeping into what is supposed to be a believing community. And this hidden form of shirk, the Quran calls it nifaq, hypocrisy. And so just like the outside shirk has to be destroyed by what? La ilaha illallah. 
Just like that the inside shirk will be destroyed by La ilaha illallah. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa. Al Hayyul Qayyum, the, the living, the source of all life, the maintainer of all things, and the source of all things that, that stand, all things that exist. When somebody internalizes that, you know what they realize? No matter how much I think I have accomplished, none of that was me. None of that was me. All of that was Allah. I have no credit. I take no credit. That is entirely given by Allah Azza wa Jal. There are so many more people that are more qualified than I am, that are more intelligent than I am, that are better spoken than I am, that Allah will not give opportunity to, and there are so many more that are much less qualified than I am, and Allah will give them way more opportunities than me, because He's the source. When you will realize He's al hayy then you realize that your life isn't actually yours. It's not yours, it's a gift given by Allah. Which means it can be taken at any moment because He's al hayy He's the eternally living. He's the one maintaining that life, al qayyum And if He's the one maintaining it, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Anyone else, any other living thing needs sleep, needs rest, needs downtime. Sleep doesn't get a hold of him. No, slumber or sleep, he doesn't get drowsy, he doesn't get sleepy. This is by the way, it comes up so much in the Quran, we don't even think about it. He keeps saying he owns everything in the skies and the earth. He owns everything in the skies and the earth. By the way, he says he owns everything in the skies and the earth or whatever lies in the, in the skies and the earth exclusively. He is the only owner of the skies and the earth. You know when you buy your house and your name's on the title, it says owner and it says your name. When you pay off your, let's just say an Islamic mortgage and you finally get the deed and it says owner of the property and your name, just write on top of that, Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fil ard. It ain't mine. That's his. That's his. Who remembers that? Who, who thinks when they go into their car, this is, my, this is not my car? Who thinks when they go into their closet and they're putting their clothes on, these aren't my clothes? It's given to me. Who looks at their hand and doesn't think this is, this is my hand? It's not my hand, it's a gift that I didn't pay for. I didn't pay for it. He owns everything in the skies and the earth. Thinking about that will change the way you live. Just thinking about lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard, and when you realize he owns everything, he's in complete charge of everything. Then where are you going to go? You know, we go to people when they own something. You go to the judge because he owns authority. You go to the store because they own the merchandise. You go to the lawyer because he owns some expertise. You go to different sources because they own something you need. That's the world. We depend on each other because each of us owns different things in a limited sense. But Allah Azza wa Jal says on Judgment Day, it'll become very clear who owns everything. Because on Judgment Day, you know, in this world, every one of us is in need. I'm in need, I, there are some things I need from my family. There are some things my family needs from me. There are some things I need from my work. And there are some things my work needs from me. There are some things I need from my government and my government needs something from me. This is a world of interdependent needs. But no day will come that will be clearer about the needs than Judgment Day. If there's one day that you and I will feel need, that's that day. When we don't even have clothes on. When we have no friends left. Anybody we dependent on has disappeared. There's nobody. Nobody. It is the greatest single gathering of humanity ever and yet you will feel the loneliest you have ever felt in your entire existence at the same time. And at that moment, you still need someone, somebody to take your, you know, speak on your behalf. And Allah says, مَن ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who's gonna make a case on his behalf? Except if Allah, if, unless if Allah gives him permission. Who are you gonna get? You're gonna need somebody to speak on your behalf. You will get no one unless Allah grants permission. And He granted that permission to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
You know, this is an honor given to the messenger. But even the way it's said, man dha, not even man ladhi, man ladhi, the dha there is very important. It's, it's even hard to communicate in English what that dha is doing there in the ayah, man ladhi yashfa'u. Who at all? Anyone out there want to speak on this guy's behalf? Anyone there? Man ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi idnihi. And then you come before, you know, this is judgment day is court. You're coming before the judge. And when you come before the judge, you're supposed to bring your case. And if you're trying to defend you, if you're the, the you know, the, the accused, and you're in court, when you come before the judge, then you're supposed to say, or your lawyer is at least supposed to say, well, your honor, you don't know the whole story. I know he committed this crime, but there's some background information he had a tough childhood, society messed him up, it was his friend's fault, something, something. There's some background information that your honor you should consider before you punish him. You understand? So the lawyer tries to bring up new evidence to defend his plaintiff, the, 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 the accused. Allah says, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ he knows what is in front of them, what they're presenting, and everything behind them. He has more information, background information about them than they have about themselves. What case are you going to bring in front of Allah? What evidence is you going to bring in front of Allah on Judgment Day? يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ On the one hand, he knows everything in front and behind of you, more than you and I will know about ourselves. And on the other hand, you, we, even together, yuhitun, they will all together not be able to encompass anything from his knowledge. Shaybi shay'im min ilmihi. You don't, you can't even know anything from Allah's knowledge. When you and I learn Quran, we learn something that Allah chose to teach us. Some things that Allah chose to teach us. But even that combined is a small, not even something small compared to Allah's knowledge itself. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think we're knowledgeable, we don't know anything. One of my favorite ayat of the Qur'an is about when we're born. When we're born. When we come out of our mothers. Every one of us came out of our mothers. He is the one who took you out of the bellies of your mothers. He delivered you. The doctor didn't deliver you. The push didn't deliver you. The C-section didn't deliver you. He is the one who pulled you out of your mothers. Because there were so many more that came out without life. There are so many more that didn't come out alive. He delivered you the successful delivery. And then he says, by the way, when a baby comes out, does the baby know anything? No. Allah says, لا تعلمون شيئاً. He didn't say, you didn't know anything. Because when he brought you out of your, the belly of your mother, this is the past. He says, لا تعلمون شيئاً, which is a hal and at the same time it could be a istinaf, which means in simple English, you still don't know anything. <laughs> Subhanallah. He didn't just say he brought you out of your moms and you didn't know anything. He says he brought you out of your mothers and you still don't know anything. لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا What are you going to encompass out of Allah's knowledge? What are these ayat doing? They're putting us in our place. Ya Rabb, I don't know anything. The angels had access to the unseen. We read about the arsh. They do tawaf of the arsh. We read about it. We read about the angels. We read about the jinn. They see the angels and the jinn. We read about Allah al-Mahfuz. They guard the Allah al-Mahfuz. They have way more knowledge than we do. The angels see a lot more, they, they see the seen and Allah has given them the unseen because they're creatures of the unseen. They even know more about ourselves because they write all of our deeds down, the ones we know and the ones we don't remember. They all lock them down. Kitabu marqum, right? They lock them down. And even the angels say, Rabbana la ilma lana. Master, we have no knowledge. We don't know anything. Allah, the angels don't know anything. The angels don't know it. What do I know then? لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا. Except what you taught us. 